Welcome everybody to Deschutes Public Library's online programming. I'm Liz Goodrich, part of the Community Relations Team, and we're glad you're joining us for a program today about Central Oregon pollinators. I'd like to introduce our speaker today, Amanda Egertson. She is the Deschutes Land Trust Stewardship Director and oversees the management of all the land, land trust protected lands. She has a BA in elementary education and music and an MS in animal ecology with a research focus on songbirds and butterflies. She leads butterfly tours on land trust preserves and is guiding the land trust work with regional monarch conservation. Please welcome Amanda. Hey everybody. So great to be here. There we go. So as Liz said, I'm Amanda Egertson, the stewardship director for the Deschutes Land Trust and I really love leading butterfly tours uh, at this time of the year. Here I am with my kiddos out in one of my favorite places to butterfly, the Land Trust Metolius Preserve. But since we can't be out in the large groups leading tours this year, I really appreciate everybody's willingness to come inside, look at some pretty pictures of butterflies and learn a little bit about their behaviors and the families that we have and a little bit about the Land Trust. So before we get started, just a, a quick Intro to the Land Trust. We're a local nonprofit here in Central Oregon. We conserve land for scenic views, wildlife, and local communities. We are celebrating our 25th year anniversary this year, which is really exciting, and to date have conserved over 12,000 acres here in Central Oregon. Um, and as I said, I love to engage with folks out on our land. I look forward to being able to do that, uh, hopefully next spring. Um, but in the meantime, I'm going to share with you first a little bit about how a butterfly becomes a butterfly, and then I'll introduce you to the five families of butterflies we have here in Central Oregon. We'll touch on some fun butterfly facts and then wrap it up with things that you can do at home to help butterflies and other native pollinator species. First of all, I always like to get people to think about how many butterflies they have seen in this area. I love to ask the question, how many butterfly species do you think we have here in Central Oregon? And most people typically say somewhere between 25 and 75. Um, and if you think about the incredible diversity of habitats that we have here in Central Oregon, everything from the desert badlands and the tiny dwarf monkey flowers out there to the high cascades when you're hiking along the streams and the lakes up in the mountains to the Metolius River, there is just tremendous diversity. We are really lucky here, I think. And reflecting that diversity is uh, the whole group of butterfly species that we have. Actually, about 130 different butterflies here. So we are definitely lucky. This is the place to get into butterflying if you're interested in that, which you must be because you're watching. Uh, so first of all, the butterfly life cycle. How does a butterfly become a butterfly? I'm going to be using a monarch to illustrate how a butterfly becomes a butterfly, but this holds true for every species of butterfly. Um, they obviously, they might have little variations in how they do it. They obviously look different. Their eggs look different. How they lay their eggs, uh, where they position them on leaves might be different, um, but they all have to go through this process. So the very first thing that happens is a female adult will lay her egg on something called a host plant. And every butterfly species has a host plant. Some of them have several host plants. Uh, maybe they're willing to lay their eggs on maybe three or four different species of plants. But the monarch um, is very specific to only milkweed. We have two local native milkweeds here in Central Oregon, showy milkweed and narrow leaf milkweed. So you can find monarch eggs if you're super lucky because um, it's hard to find them um, on milkweed. And so here you can see a picture of my finger holding a little narrow uh, milkweed leaf. And that finger I kept in there for scale. You can see how teeny tiny the monarch egg is. And then there's a zoom. I actually put my iPhone up to a microscope and took the picture of the monarch egg. And that black dot you see in the egg is actually the head of the caterpillar about to come out of the egg. So once it comes out of the egg, you can see on the left-hand side, there's an itty bitty little caterpillar. We call these mini cats because um, they're so teeny tiny. And that caterpillar has just eaten its way out of its soft eggshell. And if you look down at your pinky nail, for reference, a mini cat is shorter than the length of your pinky nail. 
and in the span of 14 days grows to be the size of your entire index finger. That is amazing. That's over 2,000 times its original size. And here you can see um, a much older caterpillar <laughs> for, uh, getting very close to uh, creating its chrysalis, which we'll talk about in a second there on the right hand side of your screen. So a mini cat to a, what's called a fifth instar caterpillar, meaning it has shed its skin five times as it's grown um, on the right. So when it, once it's done eating, and basically all caterpillars do are eat and poop. <laughs> and occasionally they rest, uh, but they're very busy storing up energy to go through their transformation. So once they're done with that, they hang upside down in a J shape. So we call this the J hook phase. And here are a pair of monarch caterpillars who have, they've spun a little silk pad you can see up close to the leaf and they're hanging from that. They hang from that for about um, 12 to, uh, 12 hours to 24 hours typically at the most. And you can see the antenna uh, on these caterpillars still kind of perky. When they're about ready to shed their final skin, you can see down here in the lower, lower corner, the antenna droop, they become very flaccid. And that's the signal um, that they are about to shed their final skin. And here that skin is actually shedding off. The chrysalis is already formed underneath that skin. The first time I watched this, it completely blew my mind. I thought, you know, back when I was a kiddo that, that a butterfly would like somehow spin a chrysalis around itself. That's actually kind of like what a moth does. They do pull things in towards their body um, in a webbing. And for the moth, it's called a cocoon. But for the butterfly, the chrysalis is actually formed already underneath the skin of the caterpillar. And then within about another 24 hours, that chrysalis turns this just incredible smooth jade color and texture. It has these gold flecks on it. It has this beautiful black and gold rim up here, which becomes very important uh, when the butterfly closes. I'll show you what they do with, with this part right here. But it is really, really incredible. And you can see here, this part is where the wing is going to uh, form. It's amazing. They will stay in their chrysalis um, for anywhere from like nine days. It's about the shortest time I've seen for the, again, this is for a monarch butterfly, up to over two weeks. And it's really dependent upon ambient temperatures. If it's really cold outside, that really slows down the transformation from caterpillar to butterfly. If it's really, really hot, like in the 90s every day, they'll crank right through and potentially close as, you know, in as short as nine days. Once the butterfly is ready to eclose, that means come out of its chrysalis, the chrysalis goes from being that beautiful jade green to being completely translucent and you can actually see the wing of the butterfly. And then you know it's going to happen very soon. And then the butterfly breaks through this shell and you can see it's using its legs to grab onto that that ridge that i showed you in a previous picture that was like that black and gold and it's it's using its legs to grab onto that and then it will hang from its chrysalis for several hours and pump uh fluid out of its abdomen you see how big and fat its abdomen is and shriveled up the wings are in this picture it goes from having a big chunky abdomen and shriveled up wings to having glorious long wings and a very skinny abdomen, which you can't see in this photo, um, because it's pulsing its abdomen, pumping body fluids into its wings, and then those dry and harden and prepare it for flight. And so here is a freshly eclosed monarch on my daughter's hand, um, and she was released very soon after that photo was taken. So that is a glimpse of the miraculous life cycle of a butterfly. Now let's move on and talk about the butterfly families we have here in Oregon. There's actually my daughter with the magnifying glass looking at a friend's nose. She has a little blue butterfly on her nose and we'll be talking about some of those butterflies in just a few minutes. First, the skippers. A lot of folks confuse these little skippers with moths. Um, they have a small stout body compared to a lot of the other butterfly species that you're going to be looking at. But these are actually butterflies and these are three fairly common ones. 
I've got the names on the slides. Hopefully you can read those. We've got the silver spotted skipper in the upper left. Um, that is one of the biggest skippers you'll see in this area. Um, then the checkered skipper, which is really common even, it's, it's common in backyards and it's common in the woods. Um, pretty distinctive, easy to pick out. And then the woodland skipper down in the lower right corner, there are several skippers that are that tawny color. Um, that one's a little easier to get confused with others. But really, if you can just, if you see these little stout bodied um, butterflies flying around and you can just remember that it's some kind of skipper, then you'll be ahead of the game. Now we're going to get into some more common butterfly species. This is the Western Tiger Swallowtail. These guys are flying in force right now, all over the place, in the town, in the woods, wherever, often confused with monarchs. Um, I think really just because of the sheer size of them, this is a fairly large butterfly, like the size of your hand, um, as is a monarch, um, and it has some bl black striping on it, as does the monarch, but you can see that this is a very buttery yellow where the monarch is bright orange. And the other pretty common swallowtail we have in this area is the pale swallowtail. So the pale swallowtail is on the right hand uh, of the slide, and that's on my son's nose. See a lot of these at the Metolius Preserve at Subtle Lake. Um, out in that area. Uh, if you, I have not seen one in Bend. Typically, we just have the Western Tiger uh, Swallowtails here and maybe occasionally Oregon Swallowtails, um, but you definitely can see these guys in the woods and they're just a very pale color. It's the main difference. And it's easy because that's their name. Easy to remember that one. Had to put the Oregon Swallowtail on because it is our state insect. You can see these on top of Pilot Butte sometimes. They do something called hill topping. It's kind of like the butterfly version of the singles bar. They'll go on tops of hills uh, looking for mates, which is kind of fun. I saw this one at Wychus Canyon Preserve though, uh, one of the land trust properties that's near Bend. Um, and those are, the preserves are open again. So I encourage you to go out for a hike and see if you can find one yourself. These are a super cool kind of butterfly, uh, Clodius parnassius, which is a real mouthful. Um, but we have a couple different parnassius species here, and the Clodius is probably the most common. Iron Mountain is the place to go if you want to see one of these. And the really cool thing about the Parnassius butterfly is that its wings are totally different. Um, I shouldn't say its wings, it's more its scales. So on the other butterflies, let me pick one, the, the color patterns that you see are created through thousands and thousands of teeny tiny little scales that are overlapping one another like shingles. But on a Parnassius, their wings are like wax paper. It is really wild. And they have a super rad fuzzy body that you can see in that photo. Okay, we're moving on to the next family. So we've done skippers, that's a family. Parnassius and swallowtails are grouped together in a second family. Now we have whites, marbles, and sulfurs. This is a Sarah's orange tip, super common butterfly in the spring. And you can see these guys anywhere. Uh, Chevlin, Phil's Trail, I see them around town occasionally. Um, pretty easy to spot and just very distinctive. Uh, it's the only butterfly that is predominantly white um, or a really light yellowish color sometimes and then has the bright orange tips. And I love the orange tips. They're super cute. Put this one in because this is a very, very common butterfly, often thought to be a moth. It is not a moth. It is called a cabbage white. And it's just, it's very simple and I think elegant. Um, but you'll definitely see these all around town. If you see a white butterfly flying around, it's like a medium size, probably a cabbage white. This is a pine white, and it is rare to see one of these on the ground. I snapped this photo a few years ago at the Metolius Preserve. Um, I actually <laughs> Didn't know what it was at first because I'm not used to seeing them on the ground. Um, these butterflies you'll commonly see actually up in the tops of pine trees. So if you're out walking in the woods and it's like July or August, these guys don't come out usually until midsummer. 
Um, and you look up in the trees and you see lots of white butterflies flitting about really high up there. They are likely pine whites. Um, and the reason why they often hang out up there is because they lay their eggs on pine needles. Their caterpillars eat pine needles. And the sulfurs, I adore the sulfurs. The sulfurs are pretty tricky to tell apart. Um, this happens to be a Western sulfur, but really um, just the main takeaway probably from this presentation is if it's a medium sized butterfly and it's predominantly yellow like this, it's a sulfur, it's some type of sulfur. Uh, some of the really rad things I think about this butterfly are that they have pink antenna. They are often edged in pink. You can see a really thin pink margin around its wings and they have big green eyes. I mean, really, it's so cool. Okay, into the gossamer wings. This is my favorite family of butterflies. I love the name gossamer wings. It's just a pretty name um, with lots of pretty butterflies. So here is something that happens to me every summer. I will get phone calls and emails saying, I saw these beautiful little blue butterflies. What were they? The trick with the little blues is that they all look really pretty darn similar on top, just this incredible vivid blue. These are the males, the, the females tend to be um, more of a, like a slate gray to muted blue color, but the males are just this incredible striking vivid blue on top. And then with the different species, they look different underneath. So I'm gonna show you some examples. These are spring azures, another really early spring emer emerger. They come out, they're like the very first blue butterfly you see every year in the spring, about the same time as the orange tips. Okay, so the spring azure looks like this underneath, kind of a chaotic looking pattern of black dots. Another butterfly that looks exactly like this on top, but different underneath, is this, the Anna's blue. So again, here's the spring azure underneath, and then the Anna's blue, really different pattern. And then here's another one, this is my favorite, is the Melissa blue. And you can see this blue sparkle iridescence and all that orange, just incredible. These tiny butterflies only live a week, a week or two at the most, and it is amazing to me that they just pack so much ornate design <laughs> into their wings. It is incredible. Okay, other members of the gossamer wing family include the cedar hair streak. This is a really easy one to spot. If you go for a hike at Wychus Canyon Preserve or sometimes around your neighborhood, you can see these at Shevlin Park. Very common hair streak. Here it is on Showy Town Sendia, one of its, one of its favorite plants to nectar from. And coppers, this is one type of copper called a purplish copper. These guys can be a little harder to spot, uh, but if you run across a field full of yarrow, uh, when you're out on a hike, you have a pretty good chance of seeing one of these. And into the final family, the brush-footed butterflies. And these guys are called brush-footed butter butterflies because of their forelegs. So here I've got an arrow on the screen pointing to the front legs on the butterfly. And they are very reduced in size and covered with teeny tiny hair so that they look like brush, like a bottle brush. Um, all insects have six legs, so three pair on each side. Um, this guy, at first glance, you'd think he might only have four legs. So here's one, two, three, four, but it does in fact have six legs because of these reduced legs. And then this one is called a comma because it has this comma shape on its wing. Other members of this family include the red admiral. I included this because this is one of the friendliest butterfly species. Uh, one of the easiest, I think, to get to land on your arm especially if you have a little bit of salty sweat on your arm. Butterflies love to come and, and sip those salts. We'll talk about that in a few minutes. Lots of fritillaries, um, so many different kinds of fritillaries in this area. This is a great spangled fritillary. The fritillaries are like the blues in that you can look at them on top, like this child is holding a fritillary, but they all look like that on top. You really have to see the underwing to figure out what kind of fritillary it is. It, they're like impidnax if you're a birder. The flycatcher's really hard to tell apart sometimes. 
This is a googly-eyed wood nymph, and I love googly eyes, so I included this one. You'll see lots of wood nymphs. We have a few different types of wood nymphs here in this area, um, but they all have eye spots on their wing, and you often see these out in the woods. Um, the reason for the eye spots, it's actually a pretty cool adaptation. Birds are one of the predators of butterflies. Um, spiders are another, um, but birds will be flying along and see one of these butterflies flitting about or maybe on a flower getting some nectar and it'll see those eyes and think it's the head. And so it'll actually take a little bite out of its wing right in this area, but the butterfly can then fly away. Butterflies can fly pretty well with tattered wings. Um, as long as it, it keeps its, its head and its abdomen uh, and part of the wings, it's good to go. So I've actually caught um, a Google-eyed wood nymph in a net and saw a triangle missing from its wing where I think a bird beak had been. Pretty cool. Okay, I am guessing everybody has seen California tortoise shells. These, this is another one I get phone calls about, that there are like thousands and thousands of monarchs clustering either on a trail or on a mountain pass. I would love it if there were thousands of monarchs, but unfortunately the Western monarch population is not doing very well. And it's unlikely that you will see thousands of them unless you're at an overwintering site in California. If you see even thousands or maybe hundreds or even tens of orangish brown butterflies uh, gathered, those are California tortoise shells. Often see them on the trail. They will be sipping salts and minerals uh, from damp soil. Um, and they, these guys go through population cycles. And so for several years, you'll see tons and tons, and then we'll go a few years and we won't see as many. It's just part of their natural cycle. I had to include this one because I just think it's a joyous picture. Um, but the other cool thing is that this is a great Arctic butterfly, another common one out in the Metolius area, out in the woods. You can tell I spend a lot of my, a lot of my time butterflying out there because I'm always referencing it. Um, but the cool thing about the Arctics is you only see them on even years. So it's 2020. That means the Arctics are out. And they'll be flying all June, July, and August. Um, it takes them two full years to go through the life cycle that we talked about earlier. They pause at two different times um, as a caterpillar and overwinter, and then they finally come out. Pretty neat. Here is a morning cloak. My son took this picture. I think it's amazing. Uh, <laughs> so I have to brag for a second about that. Um, but this is a morning cloak and these are really, th this is another kind of cool story. If you see a butterfly in the winter, like on a unseasonably warm day, let's say it's, you know, gets up into the fifties um, and the sun is really shining and everybody wants to just be outside, walk around without a jacket on for a little bit. You will sometimes see these morning cloaks flying around on those days as well as California tortoise shells. And the reason for that is that they overwinter as adults. So all butterflies have different overwintering strategies. Monarchs are the only ones that actually leave town. They're the only ones that, that migrate um, to California in our case or to Mexico for all the Eastern monarchs. But many species overwinter as adults. Um, others will overwinter as a chrysalis, some as a caterpillar. Um, but the morning cloaks are pretty common sightings on a warm winter day. And the ones that, because they spend all winter long as an adult, sometimes if we've had a really rough winter, the ones that you see in the spring will look really, really ragged. And then you won't see them again until the end of the summer. And that's because those, the, the adults that you see in the spring, they come out of hibernation, they mate, lay eggs and die. And then it'll take them the full summer to go through their life cycle. And then they you close at the end of it and you'll see really beautiful, fresh morning cloaks at the end of the summer. And then the other member of the family that of course I have to mention is the beautiful monarch. Then briefly, just wanted to touch on how to tell the difference between a monarch and a monarch, sorry, a monarch and a moth. No, the, what I really want to do is tell you the difference between a butterfly and a moth. And the main thing to key into is their antenna. So the big arrows on the screen are pointing to the two different kinds of antenna. All butterflies have a long slender antenna and then they have this little club. It's often called a club 
on the top or some people call it a ball, some people call it just a little swollen part, but you see how it's like it goes out nice and thin and then boop, a little bit of a hook and it's a little bit thicker right there. Moths, the males will often have these long feathery antenna and they have the, the, the feathery or the fern-like antenna because that increases the surface area and makes them more receptive to the female's pheromones. The female moths will often just have one long thin strand um, without all the feathery stuff going on. Um, the other thing that I wanted to touch on is the fact that moths are not all boring and they don't all fly at night. Here is a prime example. This is an elegant day moth. These guys are pretty common in our area. Beautiful, beautiful coloring. They look like rainbow sherbet or something that Dr. Seuss would create in his imagination. Um, and they fly around the woods in the broad daylight looking really beautiful. They're super cool. Um, so don't think they all fly at night. And <laughs> that's, that's the big one. They fly during the day. Lots of them do. Um, and they're super cool. They deserve a place in this conversation <laughs> is what I'm trying to say. All right, moving on to the butterfly fun facts. So this arrow is pointing at the antenna, uh, not because they're striped and totally rad looking, although they are, um, but because butterflies can actually smell with their antenna and they taste with their feet, which is a good deal if you spend a lot of your time walking around on flowers. They have a proboscis. These guys actually carry around their own drinking straw, and that is what they stick down into a flower to suck up the, the nectar. And so here, that arrow is pointing to the proboscis, which is coming out, it, it's the mouth part coming out of the head and going down into the flower. When they're not using it, they just roll it up and carry it around. They're solar powered, so that's why you only see them flying around on warm days. When it is cold or rainy or windy, they typically have to go and find shelter somewhere. So they warm up their flight muscles and then they can fly. The other neat thing is that, and we've touched on this a little bit, but you will also see them doing something we call puddling, a puddling behavior basically, which that's when they collect on the ground um, in a large group that kind of looks like a puddle, um, and they sip salts and um, minerals from the damp soil. They can't get everything they need from flowers, so that's why you often see congregations of them. Here's a group of pale swallowtails as well as a checker spot. Here's a checker spot over here. So what can you do to help? I think the most important thing to know is that no matter how much space you have at home, whether you live in a small apartment or a big house and you have tons of acres, it doesn't matter. Everybody can make a difference. If you wanna make a difference for butterflies and other important pollinators like bees, you can just plant some flowers and it can be as small as one container pot on a windowsill, as long as the window's open <laughs> or a balcony. Um, you know, to a whole garden. It, it, it doesn't matter. It all makes a difference. Um, important things to consider are bloom times. Um, having something blooming all the way from spring through fall is really, really important um, because for butterflies and for bees, different species emerge at different times. Um, so if you only have, you know, something pretty blooming in your yard or in your container pot in the spring, that's wonderful. Um, but there are lots of things in the summer and the fall that need help as well. Um, if you do have a little space, planting in clumps is really helpful. Like in this picture, you can see, you know, big grouping here and here and back here. That's a wonderful thing to do. Um, instead of spacing things out really far, um, these big clumps have been shown to um, be really helpful and attract pollinators better. Um, planting native is a wonderful thing to do. And uh, the Land Trust website has uh, lots of great tips on butterfly gardening and native plants that are very hardy in Central Oregon. Um, including milkweed is a wonderful thing. I actually just snapped this photo uh, yesterday evening uh, because I love that a bee was visiting my showy milkweed. Milkweed is not just for monarchs, it's also for other pollinator species and the bees love it, other butterfly species love it. We talked about how um, 
particular butterflies are when it comes to laying their eggs on very specific host plants, but when they become adults, um, they tend to be much more generalist and will nectar from a wider variety of things. So this is showy milkweed. The Land Trust gives away free showy milkweed seed. If anybody is interested, you can check out our website and get some sent to you. Um, narrow leaf milkweed is another great native in our area. Um, and just, I, I love this slide because it just shows the diversity of native plants, the diversity of pollinators, and a really important reminder, the other really important thing I want to say about planting your own garden or having container pots is to make sure that the plants you put in the ground have not been treated with neonicotinoids. That is a really nasty class of chemicals that is systemic. And so when it's applied to a plant, um, and that can happen before it even gets to the plant nursery where you're buying it. Um, it becomes systemic, meaning it gets into the tissue and it expresses itself through nectar and pollen and of course in the leaves. And so if a caterpillar munches on the leaf or a bee comes to collect some pollen or a butterfly stops by to nectar, um, if it has enough of the neonicotinoids in it, it can kill the adults. Um, if it doesn't kill them, it can greatly impair them in other ways. Um, so what a lot of uh, nurseries are starting to do now is to put labels in their plants that they're selling, which I think is wonderful, um, that say bee friendly. Um, they, they have a variety of, of ways that they're signing it, but it will say no neonics or ne neonic free. Um, so that's definitely something to be on the lookout for and to ask about. Um, at whatever nursery it is you like to go to buy your plants, um, whether it's Home Depot or, you know, one of the local native plant nurseries, just make sure that whatever you're buying is free of those chemicals. And with that, I will just thank you so much for joining me today, uh, for taking time out to learn about the beautiful Central Oregon butterflies um, and to follow us. Uh, you can hashtag Butterfly Brigade. You can follow us on our Land Trust website. We have uh, lots of great information about how you can be friends with our local native pollinators. Amanda, that was that was great. So many beautiful butterflies. And I, I was just looking out my, my window here and there was one flitting around. I was like, oh, it's white. I'm going to ask Amanda. Um, so I just have a couple of questions that came up for me during your presentation. Um, how many eggs does a female butterfly lay at a time? Great question. I don't know the answer for every butterfly species, but I can tell you for monarchs, it's typically between three to 400 eggs. But last year we had this crazy record breaking egg laying machine <laughs> in Brookings, Oregon, and she laid 588 eggs. Um, and, and do they lay them all at one time or is it over a course of days? Or? It's over a course of time and, and monarchs will lay their eggs singly. You know, some like the elegant day moth that I showed a slide of, they will um, lay their eggs in clumps, you know, in like clusters. I'll say, um, but monarchs and many other butterfly species will lay them singly. They'll lay them like, you know, several on one plant, um, but not in, in tight clusters. But yeah, for the monarch, it's typically three to 400 eggs. And how long does it take for a, a, a monarch um, to become an adult female? About 30 uh, days. That? Yeah, the, so it's about five days as an egg, about, you know, two weeks as a caterpillar, another, you know, week and a half to two as a chrysalis before it decloses. So tip, and for most butterfly species, if they go through egg to adult with no uh, diapause, no, no rest where like they're not overwintering or something in a, you know, installing out, um, it's typically about 30 days. All right. Um, so I, I want to tell you that you, it blew my mind to, to realize that the chrysalis was on the inside crazy that's not what the, that's that's not what i thought and and that beautiful green that's just so gorgeous yeah yeah so, it is it's mind-blowing for sure to see that happen to see that skin break open and that chrysalis right there i'm like whoa <laughs> yeah. yeah um and so my last question is about the neonicotinoids are do they do perennials get treated with those as well or is that just an annual thing no a lot of plants get sprayed with neonicotinoids unfortunately it's a it's a major 
problem right now. Um, a lot of crops, um, a lot of just a, a lot of things get treated with it um, because it's effective at killing pests. Um, but it, the problem is, is that it's, well, there are always problems with chemicals, right? But with this one in particular, um, it it's, has a long residual life, so it stays in the soil for a long time. Um, but the systemic nature of it is, is a real challenge. So it's not like it only affects something that is gonna eat its leaves. The fact that it gets into the pollen and the nectar is a real problem. And that's one of the main reasons for the, the massive bee declines, yeah. Yeah, well, thank you. I think uh, people need to be aware of that and keep their eyes out for plants that are growing without that yeah. pesticide. Yeah. Um, and also, I'm going to go on to the website today and get some showy um, milkweed <laughs> seed. <laughs> Yay! <laughs> so, uh, Amanda, really, thank you. What a beautiful, beautiful presentation. And it's, um, you know, hopefully going to inspire some people to go out and do some butterflying on their own. I hope so. so. Thank you so yeah. much. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you.